Να υποδεχθούμε τον κύριο Παπαχελά και τον κύριο Κάπλαν. Ένα θερμό χειροκρότημα, παρακαλώ. Robert, first of all, let me say it's the first time I've seen so many ND candidates running for re-election. They're real fans of you, but they were also doing the opening act for Kyriakos Mitsotakis, you understand everything, right? Me, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah. Which is all right. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me say by word of introduction that uh, Robert is not a, a stranger uh, to Greece. You lived here for, what, 10 years, I think, right? No, seven. Seven, okay. 35 years ago. Yeah, but they were very uh, yeah. uncertain years. Yeah. Well, yeah, the old czar, I guess. Yeah. Um, you remember the old uh, radio ad, you know, give us 30 minutes, we'll give you the world, all right? right. We'll try to do this. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's start by, you know, you giving us your thoughts about, you know, what's going on in the world stage now. Yeah. We're going through a very sort of uh, tumultuous and uncertain uh, kind of time. And is there, can you make sense out of it? Um, I, first of all, let me say it's a great pleasure to be back in Greece, if only for a short visit. I was here uh, a year ago for a much longer visit. And to me, Greece has always been kind of the center of the world because it's equidistant between, um, you know, between Europe, the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, Russia, so many places, North Africa. And uh, it's a great register of w the way the world is going. In terms of the world at large, I would say that we're in a geopolitical recession now. Um, all the main organizational um, um, pillars of the international community, NATO, the EU, uh, the US-Japan Treaty Alliance, um, uh, 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 America's relationships with its other Asian allies, um, uh, you know, et cetera, are much, much weaker now and are in disarray than they were, say, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Remember, in our, in our recent lifetimes, we've had two major geopolitical events. We had 9-11, and then we had the Great Recession. In both, after both of those events, in the immediate aftermath, international institutions responded well and quickly and very authoritatively. That would not be the case today if there was another major geopolitical event like 9-11 or the Great Recession because all these institutions are really weak. And that's why I say it's a geopolitical recession. Furthermore, I would say that Forget what you hear at universities about in post-colonial studies departments, that imperialism is dead. Imperialism never dies. We're living in an imperial age, and we're seeing the rise of a Chinese empire, much like the British East India Company. Um, all the pathways of Belt and Road are exactly those of the Yuan Dynasty, the Ming Dynasty, etc. And we're seeing the gradual decline of the American empire. Remember, since World War II, the United States has been an empire in all but name. Given the breadth of its military bases all over the world, its diplomatic core, uh, and on and on, its economic weight, its, the problems and frustrations of, the, of Washington are more easily compared to those of the British Empire, the French Empire, than of any, anything else you could think of. So the American Empire is in decline. The Chinese Empire is rising. So we've gone from the 20th century was an era of ideological conflict that uh, resulted in tens of millions of deaths. And now we are back to normal geopolitical competition between major powers. How does Europe fit in all of this? Um, I mean, the theory is that Europe, you have written about this, that Europe maybe is imploding from the inside because of populism, and then it's sort of dissolving from the outside, being part of the biggest, the bigger sort of Eurasian, African kind of uh, area, which was always the case, yeah. right? I, mean, I, I think the most critical thing about Europe is that there was a great French geographer in the mid-20th century, Fernand Braudel, who said that Europe's southern border is not the Mediterranean. It's the Sahara Desert. It's only where the Sahara Desert begins that Europe ends, which means that North Africa, the Levant, the Eastern Mediterranean were all historically part of Europe. 
but we forgot about that during the long Cold War years in modern history. When the, North, North, where the whole Arab world was locked up in prison states, so there was no migration to Europe. And it's the Soviet Union, though it was officially communist, acted like a very conservative, hesitant, cautious power and was boxed in by the Americans. So that Europe was, was basically isolated and could develop the good life, you know, the boring good life during the Cold War. But now Europe is again kind of besieged from all corners of the Mediterranean, from Russia. It's become part of Eurasia. And so in that sense, Europe is dissolving. In, um, in a sense, it's back to traditional geography with all of the instability that that brings. But can Europe really do anything in order to, to counter that? I mean, one thing is Europe was spoiled after the war. The U.S. was yeah. taking care of all the security yeah. uh, intelligence needs and all that. Uh, right now, we see Europe basically drifting away. There's no strong leadership. There's no compass. Yeah. How, do you see a way out of that? Um, I think ultimately, <clears throat> Europe will be dependent on what happens in Germany. Uh, Ger you know, Germany is the major central demographic, economic, political power in the heart of Europe, looking both to, to the west and to the east. And for decades, since the late 1940s, every German chancellor of the center right or the center left have all followed in the mold of Konrad Adenauer. You know, especially Merkel, who grew up in East Germany, who speaks Russian, who has a deep memory of the Cold War. Um, the question becomes, will the Adenauer model continue in future German chancellors? And if it doesn't, Germany could become more nationalist, more isolationist, uh, um, uh, more selfish in many ways, and that will determine, you know, what happens in Europe. A lot of people gave a lot of, uh, had a lot of hope for Macron, that he was really yeah. the one who was going to regenerate and sort of, uh, you know, reinvent Europe even. Yeah. Do you believe that or? No, Ma the problem with Macron is that he was uh, as much a part of the French elite as Chirac, as Hollande and others. He won an election because his opponent was mired in a scandal. And France, like Hungary, like Poland, like Great Britain, like the United States, uh, it, it, you know, is facing a crisis of the elites, where, where the elites have all the answers and they're very prone to group think, but they're unable to ask for sacrifices from their population. That's the key. Debt is everywhere. The US has a big debt. Almost every European country has a big debt. Where does debt come from? It comes from the fact that democracies can no longer ask for sacrifices from their own people. And that is the big change that goes unmentioned. One of the big ideologies that sort of brought the West together was that globalism works. Yeah. It brings more benefits, peace, yeah. stability, and all this. Now we see in Britain, in the US, everywhere, other places, that it's the Chardonnay drinking elites who believe in that, but the beer drinking sort of, you know, person in the middle of America or somewhere in the countryside doesn't believe in that. What can we offer to these people as the new sort of narrative that, you know, could really bring people together? Uh, first of all, globalization will go on and on. And we're in the very early infantile phases of globalization. But globalization so far in this early phase has divided societies up the middle rather than pulled all these countries as a whole into some global, into some upper middle class cosmopolitan world. Uh, you know, we've seen the United States, Britain, and other countries divided by globalization between those who have slipped upward into this whisk whiskey sipping, um, you know, got cosmopolitan and elite world, and they're doing quite well uh, along the east and west coasts of the United States and in university towns, but in most other places, the, the bulk of society has been left behind. China. Um, a lot of people say that it's, we see sort of a replay of old imperial policies. Yeah. But they also say that China was never really imperialistic in its designs in the past. 
What is China doing now with the Belt and Road? I mean, what, what is the end game in their own minds? Um, all right. For, all right. Belt and Road is three things that never get mentioned in the newspapers. One is it's a branding operation for what China has already accomplished building roads, railways, pipelines across Central Asia. Number two, Belt and Road is principally about Iran. It's about linking China up with Iran through Central Asia because China plus Iran is an unbeatable combination in Eurasia that sidelines the Russians. Because Iran, like it or not, is the central demographic and economic organizing principle of the whole Middle East. It fronts not just one hydrocarbon rich zone, but two with the Caspian Sea. And number three, Belt, Belt and Road allows China to suppress the Uyghur Muslim Turkic population in its west by, on the one hand, lifting up its standard of living in Western China, but on the other hand, China is becoming politically closer to all the former Soviet Muslim republics, so the Uyghurs will have no allies. That's what China really fears, is a Turkic Muslim Uyghur rebellion inside China. So it's China's very internal worries that drive Belt and Road. But do you think this is a sustainable model on their part? It's not a sustainable model if you think in terms of conventional capitalism. But if you think in terms of imperial mercantilism, it's very sustainable. The money never leaves China. China lends money you know, to, to the port of Sri Lanka or to Pakistan. Pakistan, and they use the money to hire a Chinese state company, which hires Chinese state workers, which hires, hires a Chinese logistical uh, uh, system, and then China builds it, it gets paid for it, and if the host country falls into debt, China takes the port where it can put its submarines there, where it can put it, its surface warships, etc. And if the, the country can pay its debt, all the better. All the better. But, uh... I mean, you know the famous argument that China is a rising power, the U.S. the established power. Are we going to, to get into that trap? Do you think China will actually uh, try to challenge the U.S. hegemony in the South Sea? Or? Uh, here's the key thing. Uh, if the, uh, it, it, the, the world, to the degree that it will turn on one issue, of course it won't, but if you could have like a quiz question, what's the most important unanswered question in the world? I'd say it's the internal political development of China into the 2020s. Will China become a hard-edged, uh, you know, digital, um, uh, ne uh, truly hard authoritarian, unenlightened authoritarian dictatorship using digital technology to control its population? Or will China create such a large middle class that this middle class itself becomes an, an, an aspect of instability? Because you, if you create a new middle class, that middle class is not grateful to you. It suddenly has new demands and wishes and desires. And if governmental institutions cannot become more transparent, more flexible, that middle class will lead to political upheaval. So that's the unanswered question. Which way does China go over the next 10 or 15 years? So you think adventures abroad could be a solution if there's political turmoil? Well, yes. if you have political turmoil, even of a modest extent, it doesn't have to be major. You know the um, uh, you, know, you know the incentive will be to you to employ nationalism as a cohesive device, as a cohe you know as a, as a device towards cohesion, and that of course leads us to the issues of the South and East China Seas. Okay. Now, one important thing is uh, China has built a brand with the Belt and Road, right? Yeah. And it's sort of a world brand. The U.S. used to have a brand, which was democracy, respect for civil society, et cetera. Right. I think that brand is eroding because the president doesn't really believe in it. And the U.S. cannot really offer the same thing in terms of Bell and Road. Cannot come here and build a port without... You know, I, I think you put it perfectly. Um, the truth is that the United States is not in Eurasia. It's a half a world away. So China has the geographical imperative. So if the, if the U.S. cannot use geography the way China can with Belt and Road. So the only thing the U.S. has is a big idea. You know, the idea of civil society, enlightened government, um, 
mili uh, you know, military alliance, political alliance, if the U.S. gives up on that and goes into what I call zero-sum bilateralism uh, uh, um, for each country, then China wins. I think, you know, the main overarching strategic reason that China is going to make concessions for this new trade agreement with the U.S. is because Trump actually helps China in the long run. His policies actually aid China in take, you know, in, in in taking over, not taking over Eurasia, but becoming the great power in Eurasia, so that China can afford to give these concessions. But um, you travel around the world. You talk to opinion makers all over the place. Do you detect sort of any security about the U.S. withdrawing from world stage, sort of, you know, going back from its world commitments? Um, well, uh, let me narrow that down to one place. The most important treaty ally the United States has in the world is Japan. Uh, Japanese politics are more dependable than British or French politics. They're not, Germany is compromised by its energy reliance on Russia. Uh, Japan stands tall, essentially. And for, the and for the first time, the Japanese are very, very worried about the constancy of the United States. Um, and, and despite the personal relationship between Abe and Trump. Despite that, and despite the fact that the, that the, the Japanese are terrified of what's going to happen in the Korean Peninsula, they're terrified of China, and the only friend they've had is the United States in Asia. And, that friend, and, and the United States is simply not as dependable as it was. And we could play that out with Europe and NATO and every place. So it's not, you know, what is a brand? What is a moral authority? It's not moralistic. It's not necessarily humanitarian. Moral authority is the belief within other countries that your word is dependable, that you'll be with them in five years just as you are today. It's, you know, it's the illusion of permanence, essentially. And in that sense, America is losing its moral authority. You know, when I travel around the world in different places, especially in our area, a lot of people complain about that, uh, that they don't have a clear signal from the US. They do get very clear signals from Turkey or for, from Iran or from yeah. Russia, uh, yeah. for that matter. Um, is that going to change the landscape, you think, long term? I think it already is. I think what's happened in the Middle East is you've had the collapse of all imperial systems. Ottoman, Turkish, British and French mandate systems. Um, the Soviet empire collapsed in 1991, coming back a little bit, but not to the way it was in the 70s and 80s. And you've had the erosion of American power since the Iraq war. And so the Middle East is left to its own devices. And being left to its own devices means that regional powers ride up, rise up and challenge each other. Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey are much more aggressive now than they were 20 years ago. And that's led in turn to other developments. The Arab-Israeli crisis is over. The Iranians solved it. Uh, you know, because the Ira because because of because of Iran, the Arabs realize that they have an enemy that's more that's wor that's far worse than Israel was. The Israeli-Palestinian crisis goes on continually, but the larger Arab-Israeli crisis is over because of the Iran because of what because of Iran. I won't talk about the uh, the change in the warfare. Uh, because I think that's a very important part. Yeah. For example, we see Russia. Uh, they're, doing, they're using very unorthodox kind of uh, ways, yeah. uh, which are very cheap. Uh, and they are quite effective. Yeah. Is that a new era? And how is the West going to respond to that? Yeah, uh, several things. Number one, because of digital technology, we all inhabit the same ecosystem. So that it used to be throughout history that you had an army here and another army here and they met in the middle and they had a war. But now the front line is just a click away. Um, you can have the Russians interfering in the heart of the United States in its electoral process. You can have 
all kinds of things that you couldn't have. So the, develop, the digital age is like the early stages of the nuclear age. It's like the early 1950s, where there weren't protocols. You cannot stockpile digital weapons because they become obsolete months down the line. So it becomes much more, um, you're much more likely to use them immediately. This leads to instability. Uh, remember, it's 70 years odd, 75 years since the nuclear blasts in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The, the memory, the living memory of what nuclear weapons can do is dissipating. So you're saying that nuclear exchange is more likely now than it was 20 years yes, ago? Yes, absolutely. Uh, um, absolutely. I think where um, there's, the, I, I think that, you know, the, the rise of, of digital weapons and also the rise of navies as opposed to armies. Remember, America functionally is a naval power. It's an imperial naval power. And it projects power 24-7 through its navy because there's a moral prohibition on using nuclear weapons. So they're essentially useless. Um, and, and an era of globalization is an era of container shipping which means sea lanes become more precious than ever before. So we're entering a naval age, a digital age, in which is going to make warfare more likely rather than less likely, as the fear of nuclear weapons being exploded in the atmosphere becomes further and further distant in memory. You know, one of the interesting things for me is that you have strong leaders on sort of the wrong side of history, if you see it from the liberal world yeah, order, right? Yeah. Why is that, you think? Why is there an absence of leadership on the other side? Because, uh, number one, the digital age is a post-literate age. It's an age where people have made an end run around reading. You know, uh, uh, um, the, the elites inhabit history. They read history books. They've studied in universities. So there's a continuity in their ideas. They think in terms of the moral legacy of the Cold War, World War II, et cetera. But the, but the new masses are, are kind of liberated from the past. They don't read, and they throw up leaders who are dealing or who appear to deal with problems that have been building up for decades that haven't been dealt with. Uh, you could say what you want about Donald Trump, um, but you know, trying to get the US out of Afghanistan, Syria, driving a harder line with China, with Mexico, these are, these are issues that have built up over the decades that simply haven't been dealt with by elites. There used to be an establishment in the U.S. Uh, it was called the establishment during the 70s. Yeah. Uh, what happened to it? I mean, who is in charge of foreign policy now? Um, I, well, there isn't a, un, a, a united establishment anymore. Um, I'm writing a book now which is in part a history of the State Department in its golden age in the 1980s under George Shultz. Um, James Baker and others, and that you had real serious arguments between moderate liberals and moderate Republicans within the, within the diplomatic corps and the foreign service, but those battles were so minor compared to today, compared to the ideological divide today, that they almost weren't, they were just nuances, differences of opinion. So you don't have a united establishment in the way you did before, where, where, where you could have Democrats and Republicans who were divided only because their social networks were different, not because they really had starkly different political ideas in foreign policy. Now, the question is, is this sort of a, a permanent kind of phenomenon? Is this going to be reversed? I mean, does it depend on whether Trump is reelected, to put it in practical um, terms? I think that, in a sense, there's no going back to a pre Trump age because um, America was a great, inspiring democracy in the print and typewriter era. It's unclear that it can be as inspiring and as functional in the digital and video age. And I think that, um, that Trump is a creature of the digital video age. It's impossible to imagine him except inside this, uh, the, um, this new age. And people, Americans, and the rest of the world too, consume news differently than they used to. 
Um, and, and they don't read 1,500 word, absolutely objective, professionally written essays about India, Pakistan, or whatever the way they used to. They get their news in one or two sentences. It's out of context. It's often factually incorrect. So you're not going to, you know, the digital world has created an, an electorate that's simply less well informed than in earlier ages. Now, you told me before. While you're working on this book, you're doing sort of a portrait of the typical person who is the opinion maker in this new Trump era, let's say. And you said they're not career people, they're business people, right? They come from the private sector. Oh, uh, yeah, this, this is different. Um, yes, uh, Trump has to a certain extent, and we'll see if this is reversible, he has upended the way that Washington works. In the past, the way you'd, you know, you'd have some, you'd work at a think tank, you'd graduate from a great school, you'd go to work at a serious think tank, then you'd go into government as a deputy assistant secretary of this or that, and then you would come back to the think tank for a few years, go back into government as assistant secretary of this or that, then back to the think tank, then maybe an undersecretary or so. This is the way the American imperial system worked, essentially. But Trump has essentially um, you know, discarded to a significant degree the think tanks in a way. And, yeah, um, so that you know, people are wondering, I know I, I've worked for a think tank for 10 years, Pe young people are wondering, is this, is this still a good career to go into if my ambition is to work in government? And think tanks could have a lot of problems, but they do produce expertise, and expertise defends you against making big mistakes. Let me go from the global to the local a bit. Um, the Eastern Med, how do you see it you know, sort of developing in the next few years? Is there going to be a great power competition played out here? Well, I think the Eastern Med is part of this greater Europe, which includes the Middle East, North Africa, uh, the Balkans, Russia, et cetera. Of course we have, and this was stated at a great panel earlier this morning, the whole natural gas energy phenomena, which is bringing together countries which you'd never thought of would be working, would be working well together. Egypt, Israel, um, Greece, Cyprus, et cetera. You know, this is the new thing. And this is also part of China's Belt and Road, because it's not just Piraeus port that China's developing, also ports in Italy right up to the river port of Duisburg in Germany. So this is all, you know, the Western extension of, the, of Belt and Road for China. So you put Belt and Road together with, you know, gas pipelines underwater, and you have a region that's been, you know, been totally transformed in a way. And in that context, I think, as I said, for the world, the big question was what happens internally in China. I would say for the Eastern Med, the big question is what happens internally in Turkey. Your yeah, on uh, that? well, in the past, since the death of Ataturk, you had Turkish democracy would last 10 or 15 years. You'd have a military coup, 1971, 1980, 1960, um, and the military would stay in power two or three years, then return the country to the politicians. And this oscillation between short military rule and long democratic rule made Turkey su uh, sufficiently stable. And there was always, a, you know, and, and predictable. The future was always somewhat predictable because Erdogan has emasculated the military. And as his rule becomes more and more unenlightened semi-authoritarianism, it's, you know, it's harder to predict where all this leads, whether this will just all peter out into some election where he loses and goes away, okay. or it becomes far messier. But clearly there's no exit strategy for Erdogan, right? I mean, no, there's no exit strategy. So Turkey, in a way, is potentially more unstable than it's ever been since in the years following World War I and the ascension of Ataturk. Because the Kurdish issue, it's not just that the Kurds are in the southwest. They're everywhere in Turkey. They're in large neighborhoods in Izmir and uh, in Istanbul and, and other places. So. This, you know, you know, the, the question of Turkey's stability is, is a question that exists now, whereas before it didn't exist. Do you see a danger of uh, Turkey drifting away from the West uh, in a more, on a more permanent basis? Um, I think it's already drifted away. The question is, can it come back halfway? Um, 
uh, Erdogan is a great admirer of Putin, you know, very much so. Uh, Turkey gets gas via the Blue Stream pipe pipeline across the Black Sea from Russia. Um, he, um, I think he's over extended himself in the Middle East since, the, for judging from the beginning of the Syrian conflict in 2011, he thought that Turkey could execute some kind of neo-Ottoman and semi-imperial strategy in, in northern Syria and elsewhere. And, you know, he, it, it turns out it doesn't have the capacity to do that neatly. Let's move to the Balkans. Uh, you started your career by writing about, about the, the Balkans. Do you think there's any chance uh, this area will ever escape history and geography? Yes, but it, there's only one sure route under the umbrella of the European Union. The European Union is the necessary empire, as I've written in the New York Times. You know, it's an imperial system like China, like the Americans, etc. but it's a necessary one. And because if you look at these countries, um, Serbia, Montenegro, you know, on and on. Um, these have always been weakly governed, weakly institutionalized, badly run states at, with differences with each other, the Serbs with the Albanians, and their only real definite hope is that they can solve their problems, turn away from ethnic nationalism under the umbrella of the European Union. So if the European Union does not expand, you know, um, these countries will always be in trouble. But you know, there's no real desire, as you can see on the part of the European Union. Absolutely not. And that's why I say that the weakening of the EU over the last decade, the real victims have been in Central Eastern and Southeastern Europe, more than in Western Europe. Because, the, you know, the, um, the goal, you know, the desire, the wish, the need of the Balkans was that the EU would expand and be strong and vibrant. And that way, solutions to uh, problems in Kosovo, et cetera, become much easier. They become almost natural and organic. But the way things stand right now, do you see the risk of sort of a uh, Albanian, Serbian kind of, you know, conflict or other no, things like this no, emerging? No, absolutely no? not. Uh, I don't because what gave rise to the Yugoslav War was the collapse of a federation, of a, of, of a, of a, you know, of a small imperial system under Tito with a lot of weapons awash. That state, that system has collapsed already. Um, so I don't see any possibility for major conflict. I like don't in the see Balkans. any external actors like Russia or Iran or Turkey playing games here. Um, look, um, as someone put it to me, Russia. And, and Turkey are competing for influence in Macedonia, elsewhere, and it's only the Germans who are keeping them out because of the power of the German economy extending deep into southeastern Europe. Now, you lived here for many years, as you said before. You've been here quite a few times. Has Greece changed? Do you see potential in this country? Do you see structural problems, you know, Look, sort of uh, bringing it down? Greece has the most magnificent geography in the world for a variety of reasons. It has stores of talent. Um, the problem has always been governance. You know, tax laws, <laughs> administration. <laughs> no, that's what the problem's been. Um, it's governance. It's not talent. It's not geography. I mean, um, and, and, you know, I mean, this conference was unimaginable 35 years ago when I lived in Greece because the, the, Greek, the Greek branch of the global elite simply did not exist in the sense that it does today. So this is where there's hope. You know, this is where there's hope. But if you look at Greek history over the course of the 20th century, and you look at Metaxas, you look at Venizelos, you look at the whole history, the problem was always that governments were disappointing in what they delivered, even under the, the best prime ministers. Um, so that, um, I, I, you know, so that the 20th century was, not, was a mildly tragic century for Greece. It never lived up to its potential, essentially. Um, but this is a new century, and um, I, I think with the right kind of governmental reforms, you know, real strong, bold reforms, there's no limits to what this country could, could do, given its geographical situation in a naval shipping age that we're, in, we're just entering.
Peter, I told you we're going to do a good opening act for you, right? Uh, um, I know that, you're, uh, that uh, Henry Kissinger is a great hero of yours. It's not necessarily the case with the average Greek, I have to say. Um, <laughs> but I know you follow very closely yeah. his thing and all yeah. this. What is he thinking about these days? Well, I spent the Christmas holidays with him. And uh, we were talking about, number one, Russia. He recognizes Russia's done a lot of bad things. But the United States needs to build leverage with Russia so that it can then establish a normal, frank relationship, which unfortunately cannot be done under this administration because it's too compromised. It's simply too compromised for that. Um, He's worried very much that the Trump administration has divi divided U.S.-Chinese uh, relationship into silos, where it's trade, 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 tariffs, tariffs, tariffs. That's what the economists do. They get very aggressive. And the other silo is the military one, the South China Sea, the East China Sea. Kissinger is worried that the Trump administration does not see China in an, in an organic sense, our relationship with really it. It's pushing Russia Ru towards China. Not like only that, it's that if you get, if, if, trade, if, if trade talks do be, go bad, that actually makes the South China Sea more unstable. Because back in October, when, when the Trump administration was really bashing China over trade, the Chinese had a warship that, you know, that cut across the bow of a U.S. guided missile destroyer. It refused entry of a U.S. amphibious warship into Hong Kong power in port. What the Chinese were saying, you play tough with us with trade, we'll play tough with you in the military sphere. The two cannot be separated. They cannot be disaggregated. Is Trump listening to him? Has he called him into the Oval Office or anything? Or? Not recently, not recently. Um, in other words, Kissinger's point was that the U.S.-Chinese relationship is wide-ranging, it's organic, it has to be managed because it will be the organizing principle of geopolitics in the 21st century. Let me end it up where we started. Let's say there's another mega event, another 9-11 of some sorts. So what's going to be different this time around? Well, first of all, it's likely it would be a cyber event because we, you know we've only seen a cyber attacks in their infancy, in the very beginnings, without us. And the problem with a serious cyber attack that takes down a stock market or it takes down a, you know, an electrical grid in a major city is that it may not be possible to identify the perpetrator immediately. It may take some weeks or months. So, so respo the response can be really problematic. But it's likely it will be some combination of a cyber event and something else, I think. And the world reaction, the, the, the alliances? It the won't be as coordinated. Uh, and therefore, it won't be as forceful, probably, as the immediate reaction to 9-11, where even Iran and Russia supported the Bush White House in the first year after 9-11. And, and it won't be as, you know, you won't have the kind of central bank coordination that you had with the Great Recession, which may not have been great, but it was better than you would get now, most likely. Are you worried about the walk the dog kind of uh, scenario under Trump, you know, if he gets into political turmoil? What, what do you mean? An adventure, you know, a war or something. Um, here's how a, a war could happen under Trump. Um, the, the, policy make, the, the policy decision making process in the, you know, in the executive branch has partially uh, broken down in the sense that deputies meetings, principals meetings are not held with the frequency and the organizational quality that they used to be, where decisions funnel up to the White House so that nothing wild and crazy is decided or happens. Um, it would be because of a breakdown in the decision-making process and a, an impulsive statement or act by the, by the president that could create you know, a nightmare. Okay, on that uplifting note, thank you, Robert. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> that was fun. Thank you. Thank you.